Greetings, this is Ty Brown with Athletic Director U. We are here at the 2022 Women Leaders in College Sports National Convention. I am joined by Chris Plonsky. Chris is the Chief of Staff at University of Texas and Diane Turnham. Diane is the Deputy Athletics Director at Middle Tennessee State. Greetings ladies, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Now you guys are, are, are unique in terms of, Diane, you've been at your, your institution for 40 years. Yes. And Chris, you've been at Texas for 35 years. Correct. So she has you beat at the institution, <laughs> but you've been in the industry for 46 years True. and for you it's 42. So yes. you guys have a, a wealth of, when you talk about experience, right? And you're talking about inherent knowledge of the industry, specific inherent knowledge of your institution, been through a number of different changes, seen the ups and downs of everything, right? Wins and losses and scandals and everything else you can talk about, right? Celebrations and challenges. So I wanted to have you guys on to talk about a little about that. And, and the first question I, I have for you, and we'll start with you, Chris, is being the, the, the consistent or stabilizing force on a college athletics department for so long and with a number of, of uh, different transitions in terms of athletic director or presidents or the people around you, talk to us a little bit about like culture shifts, right? But if you're a staple in the culture, there's there's probably a lot of, of you in that culture, right? And, that's, you know, maybe not something you brag on, but you've been there. And through changes, people have wanted to keep you there because they thought you were important to the culture. So talk a little bit about that in terms of your tenure. Well, I think most of us who have been in our uh, great industry for a long time feel blessed. Mm -hmm. um, it really is special to be um, in a higher education setting. Mm -hmm particularly in, in the case of Texas, at a major research campus that is not just nationally renowned, but it's world renowned. Right. And it has impacted so many people. And so athletics culture must be derived from the institutional system of values and ethics mm -hmm. and mission. And so uh, throughout changes, and that includes institutional change too, because we've changed conferences several times. Right about to do another one in a couple years. Mm -hmm. um, but the institutional values and what drives the University of Texas and those who have gone there, our alumni, who support it, and those who work there, is really about uh, transforming people to help change the world. And so I think uh, the attitude that we all should take when there are leadership changes, as there are in athletics, coaches, athletic directors, mm -hmm and presidents who truly are in charge of everything on campus, uh, you've really got to adhere to what the institutional mission is and keep your head down and keep focused on that because usually that will translate to good work in athletics mm -hmm. because when those things are aligned, uh, success happens despite turbulence or change. Right. So I, I believe, again, in leadership. Leadership is placed above me and others uh, who are on our staff. Uh, on behalf of our coaches and student athletes who we're there to work for and with. Mm -hmm. And so throughout change, um, all of us at Texas have tried to uh, adhere to uh, what, what the thing is. Okay. What do we do every day to fulfill the mission of what we're here on this campus for? And in our case, it's to develop these young men and women who get to represent us in competition mm -hmm but they're there to get a degree and hopefully we prepare them to go out and be impactful and productive and ethical citizens. Right, and, and keeping that at the forefront of what you've done and the various roles you've held there at Texas is, is really helping to stabilize things, whether it's chaos or whether it's smooth, just understanding the purpose of the department to enhance the academic mission of the university and, and, and doing that at a high level. That's right. Yeah, you just don't want to add to the chaos yeah. and disruption if it comes from uh, external forces. Mm -hmm. So trying to be, um, you know, a, a reasonable voice or uh, a, a modicum of consistency, I think, is something that I've learned from great leaders over time. Right, right. Excellent. I am. When you talk about being a stabilizing force for 40 years at Middle Tennessee, Talk to us a little bit about, about culture and about change and, and trying to up, up, uphold the values of the university, which when everything changes, there has to be some values that people operate by. You know, I, I think you're right. It's so important that uh, you embrace your university and its culture. 
uh, and I've been very fortunate. Uh, yes, I've chosen to stay mm -hmm. at an institution for 40 years because I believed in our mission. I believed in what we were doing. We've had excellent leadership from the top. Uh, and uh, I came in uh, as a fresh out of college young lady, uh, excited to uh, just be participating in a sport that I loved, uh, continuing my career coaching and quite honestly thought I would be there three or four years and move on mm -hmm. because I was really going to be an elementary school teacher. <laughs> that was plan, and right? uh, you know, I found out uh, that I was placed there, I believe, by, by God above. Mm -hmm. uh, and. Uh, I was placed in a unique situation where I was one of the only females in the department. I'm sure Chris had some of the same experiences and, uh, you know, I didn't really realize uh, maybe the significance of that, but it taught me a lot about leadership because uh, I had to look for uh, leaders and for examples in a lot of different places, not necessarily at the institution at the time for uh, female leadership, but I had a lot of... Uh, uh, individuals that were great influences and that made me want to become a better leader uh, and change with the times because everything we do is about change. People resist change and yet we don't move forward without change. Yeah. And so uh, I, I'm a big believer in uh, what our institutions do when I talk to people about our culture, uh, certainly athletics, is certainly not the most important thing on our campus. Mm -hmm. But we kind of view ourselves as the front door of our university and we hopefully bring a lot of people onto our campus to learn about the great success that our universities have had. And so I, I just think um, it's a passion that you uh, just develop. Mm -hmm. And I, I tell our athletes when they come to me for career advice, one of the things I tell them is that if you find a career that you are passionate about, you never work a day in your life. And you work hard, but, but you love what you do. And you want to get better, but you also want to hire better. Uh, one of the things people kind of um, have questioned me about is uh, when I first came to middle, they asked me, to coach two sports at the same time, yeah. and I'm like, what? <laughs> uh, I came to coach basketball for a, for a former coach, and he taught me everything I knew, and he pushed me harder than I had ever been pushed in my life. Mm. And when he recruited me, I didn't want to play for him, but when he offered me a job, I came back. <laughs> it's a whole different situation. Um, and that taught me so much because I was put in a very difficult position where I coached two sports, one of which I didn't know anything about, which was volleyball. Mm -hmm. And I learned something very valuable from that, is that in this world of change and trying to make things better uh, each day, you look for people who have that same passion and drive, but you also look for people who have skills greater than your own in certain areas. And maybe I stumbled upon that uh, coaching volleyball because I knew nothing and I had to learn a lot. So a lot, all the time I was hiring people that probably knew more about the sport than mm -hmm. I did. But I was able to see how our success continued to grow. So whether it's hiring a coach, whether it's hiring an administrator, mm -hmm. I'm looking for that person that uh, is so passionate about what they do, committed. Uh, I know most people don't stay somewhere for yeah. uh, 40 years, nor do I expect them to, but they're going to make middle better while they're there. And I think that's what I've seen from, from Chris and other, you know, the Joan Cronins of the world. Mm -hmm. I, I've learned a lot from a lot of people that that's, that's how you succeed. You invest in, in people with a great drive and, and a passion to succeed. And I think that makes us all great. It does. It's interesting hiring. You, you both have, have have probably hired a number of coaches, staff, and a number of things who you bring into this culture that we're talking about at your respective institutions, and they may or may not work out. I wonder about identifying someone who you believe that will fit into the culture of an institution that you've been at and have helped cultivate, and bringing that person on, interviewing them, and, and, and really, even before the need is there, you identifying candidates that you may need for this position. You've done a number of that when you were uh, the women's athletics director. And talk to us a little bit about that in terms of identifying people you think will fit in the culture. And sometimes you hit or miss. Okay. Yeah, I, I alluded to this that, you know, every hire is important. Right. But there's no um, 
pressure felt that is larger than making a, a, the right coaching hire. Mm -hmm. um, they're the most important people we hire given our structure and our system. They are the identifiers of the student athletes who will be recruited to our institutions and they're, they're surrogate parents once those young yeah. people come. And so, uh, and, and ironically, um, I've never coached. Um, I tease people that many children are better off today that I didn't <laughs> because I, I have uh, such great respect for coaches, including you, who have done it because they really um, are about other people's children. That's what coaching is. You're, you are caretaking other people's children. And there's no uh, bigger challenge and there's also no greater sacrifice that you make. Yeah. Um, so identifying coaches who are in it for the right reasons because they want to help young people, that's the critical component. Uh, Donna Lopiano used to describe coaches as master teachers because mm -hmm. in their craft, be it volleyball or tennis or basketball or football, she truly believed that their courts, fields, et cetera, were their classrooms. And, but she demanded much more than the X's and O's that were going to be uh, executed in uniform. What she wanted from those master teachers was example setting, culture building, character building, teaching young people how to be selfless, how to play a role, mm -hmm. uh, how to uh, embrace diversity and embrace tolerance because not everybody is alike. Uh, you never build teams with 12 superstars. You don't build coaching staffs that way either. Mm -hmm. um, so for every coaching hire I made, I reminded them uh, without telling them what to do, hire great assistants, but also be mindful that they don't have to be exactly like you, um, you know, have a balance. Yeah. Uh, and at the end of the day, give, the, give these young people a great experience, do things by the rules, don't cheat, and have fun. Uh, make sure that there is a, uh, a means to an end, uh, but at the utmost, 1% um, of our young people are going to be capable of making a living due to their athletic gift. And yeah. we have to make sure that they get their degree and uh, are prepared with the programming we can give them to go out and compete in this global competency demanding job market mm -hmm. that we know this world to be. So uh, again, uh, it, it's fun. The hiring process is always fun regardless of the position, but especially uh, in, in coaching, it's just so too. critical. So, so I wonder, <clears throat> having the lens of longevity right, at your respective institutions, are there coaches that have come and gone, but they have, have left their mark on the culture? And it's like, this part of what we do, or this part of how we think was because this person was here at this time, and it, it's an excellent thing, and it helped us improve as an institution. Can you guys identify, maybe not the coach, but specifically any, any type of example of that at your institution? You know, <clears throat> I'm actually gonna, <clears throat> uh, not one I hired, but uh, you know, yesterday as I watched Nikki Vargas talk about uh, Pat Summit and how at first she hated her and she was ready to transfer. Um, you know, uh, I came along about the same time that Pat came to mm -hmm. UT, and I always believed that uh, given the right opportunities and the right resources, that uh, our women's sports could excel and do the things that a lot of our men's sports were doing. And, and I watched Pat come into UT, uh, what a hire. Uh, you know, and, and at the time she was just, you know, fresh out of college herself and, and trying to make a name for herself. And, but hard work uh, and determination uh, takes you so far in so many areas. And um, I, I, I want to hire people that I know are going to push our athletes to become better than they are. Yet we talk about can't have 12 superstars. Mm -hmm. It takes a great mix. Um, I believe in the team concept so much because none of us succeed without a great team around us, whether it be our coaches, whether it be whoever. Uh, we have to have that great team and we have to learn to be a part of a team. And if you can't do that, then, you know, I may right. question how successful you can be. And so uh, I've always tried to look for that in, in my coaches that I bring in. Uh, because whether, whether they remain 20 years or five years, did they come in? Did they make the program better? 
uh, and can they, did they set a, a good platform for the next person to come in? Right. And I think that, uh, you know, I, I've been fortunate enough to serve on some NCAA committees mm -hmm. and people say, well, where do you look for people? Well, as you sit in those committees and, and you work hard, uh, if I'm working, I had the pleasure of being on the women's basketball committee met a lot of young mm -hmm. up-and-coming coaches yeah. so where do I look I go back mm -hmm. uh, our, our business is all about contacts and uh, you know um, people ask me all the time how do I get my resume out of the stack of 200 yeah. and it, it's not what's on that resume but it's who you know and who may be able to call for you because if Chris calls me about someone, an up, young up-and-coming coach, I'm going to listen. Right. Uh, if Pat called me about uh, somebody, I'm going to listen. And so I try to impress that upon people is that we have to find the, the young rock stars coming up that are, are going to be uh, committed to doing things the right way. I cannot emphasize that enough. Uh, but that are uh, so committed to investing in our future. Uh, you know, if you come in my office, there's nothing but pictures. And I can tell you a story about every one of those former athletes yep. because <clears throat> we bring them in and we help them, number one, find that degree that, that will hopefully support them for the rest of their life. Mm -hmm. uh, and when they walk across that stage to get that diploma, we're just as happy if, as if they have won another championship because that, too, is, is a great success for them. And so being able to sit back and, and look at some of your own that have come in to your program and have succeeded and the coaches that help them uh, is is truly the greatest part yeah. about what we That's do. It. It, it's it's building people to to be better citizens, and so you look for those qualities in your coaches. Your when coaches, you're it's an amazing them. thing. Chris, what about you? You've had a number of coaches, a number of high profile coaches there. Um, can you remember an instance where someone who has come and gone uh, from at this point, but they left a legacy that it's, it's still kind of felt. Texas. Well, as, as we continue to celebrate this benchmark 50th year since Title IX passed, it's, it's hard not to think about the, the many coaches who, who labored in an era where often they were asked to coach for, because they had other jobs, usually teaching or mm -hmm. professorial. Uh, my coach at Kent State, Judy Devine, uh, became uh, the first uh, you know, women's AD, but she also coached field hockey and basketball uh, in the era that I went to college, which was the late 70s. And she was the one who got me involved in athletics. So I owe my coach, um, I played a little basketball for her, didn't play nearly as well as I ended up writing for the Daily Kent Stater, <laughs> but I always appreciated those teams. And uh, and then growing up as a young person in Western PA in uh, Northeast Ohio, my dad, who was a former college football player, at what is now Louisiana Monroe. Back then it was Northeast Louisiana. Um, he and I would sit and watch games and inevitably we would see the Texas Longhorns and Daryl Royal's mm -hmm. team. And um, as you go through life, you, you really do uh, sometimes get lucky to know personally, uh, but also to watch the impact of great people and coaches. So for me, the start was Judy Devine mm -hmm. going to Texas and just seeing the the, the aura that Coach Royal, who was no longer coaching by the time I got to Austin in the early 80s, that he still had the reverence yeah. that his former players and people in Austin, people all over the, the country really involved in football and college athletics, because Darrell also served as an athletic director mm -hmm. in, in those days. Yeah. He, he could serve two jobs. Um, and Daryl hired Eddie Reese, who our men's swimming coach, who is still in the business, has won 15 national championships. And um, again, that carries on. He reminds our staff that he was hired by Daryl Royal, and he says that with, with such respect, and and because uh, he was a young man when he got that job, and what an opportunity. But I will always appreciate, certainly at Texas. Um, when I think about the people that made an impact, not just at our institution, but nationally, um, you know, Donna Lopiano, who was not a coach, but mm -hmm. was a leader, but she knew how to hire master teachers. Right. And, and Jody Conrad has had the impa mm -hmm. impact that you can expect of uh, like a Pat Summit and her former players are reflective of her as Nikki is of Pat. None of the former basketball players under Coach Conrad surprised me with their confidence, with their mm -hmm. success, with their uh, stick-to-itiveness. Mm -hmm. 
their discipline, their elegance, their grace, their class, because she emphasized that as we were growing women's basketball in a, a you know, a, a football dominated market and oh, women's yeah. athletics became a signature in Austin because of their leadership and how it was packaged. And again, Jody was also the women's AD and hired some great coaches herself be before I took the chair. Um, but I think about more, not necessarily names, but how people went about their coaching or leadership business and those, um, those values and traits of integrity, uh, relationship building, honesty, humor. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, Daryl had a, a quick sense of humor. He was quick with a quip. And I watched other coaches say, that's a handy little trait to have as I go through coaching because Lord knows they have pressure, but there's a way of deflecting that and mm -hmm. being able to to approach um, ups and downs with humor is is a very strong quality that relaxes people around them, including their student athletes. Yeah. So um, again, I think that the uh, higher ed setting um, allows um, uh, those kind of people to succeed at the highest level and to create peer relationships across campus and across their communities because yeah. people can really connect with which them. Is, which is interesting and coaches have a lot of quips, especially the ones from Texas, right? They, they do. <laughs> Dance with who brung you. <laughs> exactly, right. <laughs> Shit no G waiting on O. <laughs> um, okay, I'll ask a couple questions and then we'll wrap. The first one is about titles and responsibilities. I mean, you guys have had a number of titles at your respective institutions and I still think about the women's AD title. That's just interesting to me, right? But, but you guys have had a number of titles at your respective institution, which came with a number of responsibilities. And now you see titles like Senior Vice Premier President of the Athletic Executive Associate, right? It's, it's crazy. But, but I wonder about what are one or two responsibilities that you have held on to throughout all these titles and responsibilities that you had? Over, over the time? Because there's probably something that's close to you, and it might just be engaging student athletes or something like that, but one or two things that you got. You know, everything we do is about people mm -hmm. and building relationships. And uh, I think the greatest thing that we can do, whether we're a coach and we're bringing in our athletes and trying to get them to mesh together mm -hmm. and respect each other and play for a common cause, uh, develop them uh, for their future occupation. Uh, no matter what we do, we are uh, de developing their character, their, uh, we're, we're, we're poising them for their success. And so whether I was coaching, whether I was doing compliance, mm -hmm. uh, whether I was moving into an administrative role, uh, it's all about taking someone, whether it's that young coach, and helping them find their way uh, to become the next What's best the coach. Right. Uh, it's, it's all the same. It's about developing relationships, uh, caring about those people. You know, uh, the, the old saying is people don't know how much you care. To, yeah. They don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's important in our positions uh, to care about them as individuals. and help them reach their full potential, whether they're our athlete, whether they're our coach, whether they're our next administrator. Uh, we're, we're just developing uh, great leaders. Yeah. And if you can do that, uh, no matter what your title is, it really yeah, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Uh, you it's know, excellent. whether it's the president of the university. You know, we, we have, we've been very fortunate to have a president who's been very involved in athletics, and maybe they all are. Mm -hmm. But at, at Middle Tennessee, we've had some people that are very committed to knowing about what we're trying to do and, and, and some of the goals that we have and meshing those two in as, as, as she said earlier, meshing them into our university goals. It's a team effort no matter yeah. what. And uh, that's why I have such a high regard for athletics because I think it's, it's developed a lot of great leaders over the years and that gives me passion every right. day to, to bring excellent. in that new athlete, that new coach, that new compliance person, whoever it may be and help them develop uh, and make our program or another program better. Yes, ma'am. What about you? Well, uh, yeah, you know, that journalism degree uh, comes in handy, mm -hmm. I think, in every aspect of all the titles or jobs that I've had. Uh, Chris Talcani, our great leader at Texas now, every once in a while he'll call me Columbo because mm -hmm. 
I sometimes want to investigate things a little more mm -hmm. to piece things together because it really taught critical thinking. Yeah. Um, but communication really, for me, has been the heart of a lot of my ability to, to stay in athletics and move through the system because, like she said, it's about being able to listen because communication isn't about talking. Mm -hmm. It's about sensing and, and often about listening to try to uh, create that empathy for the person across the table from you. Um, it also um, leads you to be able to, if you can write, you can storytell. And public relations is still, to me, the heart of, of much of what we do for athletics because we want to be an asset to our great campuses. And storytelling about what we do accomplish uh, that is far beyond the scoreboards is really important. Uh, I think too, you know, now I'm chief of staff, but really my, my real duties in that role are to help, again, CDC, our, our leader, um, run a very sophisticated, uh, well-resourced department. We have 21 sports. We just announced beach volleyball as a new addition. But I uh, have the privilege of working directly now in this role with all of our uh, student support service area leaders in academics, enrollment management, uh, compliance, sports medicine, wellness, behavioral health, nutrition, all those things that we do for these young people to help them succeed in this four to five year window. And I remember when Chris uh, was hired at Texas in um, December of 17, um, we talked and, and um, you know, I said, Chris, I'll do anything you want me to do, including retire because I don't want to get in your way. But you know, after we talked, he said, you, I want you to have a role. Um, but we talked about the great coaches we had. And then I told them, I said, those coaches are who we work for along with the students. I said, but when you meet our behind the scenes people, the team behind the team, as we say, mm -hmm. you will see some incredible professionals who could, to me, work anywhere in the pi private or public sector, but they choose to work here because they love this environment. They want to help our coaches succeed and they want to help these student athletes succeed. So, you know, chief of staff could mean a lot of things, but what it really means is people mm -hmm. and the people who impact our coaches and our young people. Which is important, people in communication. I'll ask this last question and then we'll wrap to both of you. And if the pressure's on to be brief because you'll get your best creativity if you're brief, right? Um, no matter when this video is published or when somebody wa watches it, there will be transition. Athletic director, president, head coach, and the people who work in those environments get very uncomfortable and unsure about the future when there is a transition. Am I going to be here? Do I want to be here? Will this person keep me? Will I find another job? So I wonder if you guys can give a brief, quick word of advice for people going through tra transition on how to kind of steal their nerves about what's to come. Because you, you don't know, right? Hmm. I see you looking over here, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I think it is difficult having gone through new athletic directors. And Chris just mentioned that, you know, one of the things she first said to, to Chris was, if, I, if yeah. you want me to retire, I will. Yeah. And I felt the same way when Chris Massaro, my current mm -hmm. AD, came in. I've been there a long time. And you always know they may have people mm -hmm. that they want to bring into your organization. But I think the most important thing is being adaptable. Uh, heaven knows, coaching, uh, administrating, it, everything has changed since we first started. Yeah. How have we adapted to those changes and how do we now take our student athletes as they come to us mm -hmm. and make them better? Well, same thing with our staff. No matter who comes into the new chair, we've got to find uh, what that individual is wanting to accomplish and we've got to be a part of it. And if you're willing to be a part of making the institution better, then you're just, you're going to continue in your yeah. transition and, and you're going to support the person at the top, whoever that may be. Which is excellent. And I think that's the most important thing. It is. That, yes. That's the first thing that, that we all should learn to tell ourselves is when leaders change, they were put in the chair by another leader, respect that authority, continue to be respectful and listen to the new boss. Mm -hmm. um, there, uh, um, John Makovic, our former football coach, told me once, change has no constituency. Mm -hmm. I tattooed that for a while on my wrist <laughs> when I you know, was at Texas because it's, change is never popular. Yeah. 
but when something does change, just again, steal yourself. It's not about you. It's about the institution. It's about what the institution's mission is. Put your head down, go to work, and be respectful of that new leader and do whatever that new leader asks you to do. Uh, which, is, which is excellent. Ladies, this has been an excellent conversation. I really appreciate you joining us here on Athletic Director U. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Yes, that was Chris Plonsky. Chris is the Chief of Staff at Texas and Diane Turnham. Diane is the Deputy Athletics Director at Middle Tennessee State. And of course, amongst them, they have a number of years at their respective institution. And of course, I'm Ty Brown with Athletic Director U. And keep in mind, the role of a leader is to create and maintain an environment that people want to be a part of. And as always, be better tomorrow than you are today.